Hey, Joe, let's start with the leaked paper uh, titled, We Have No Moat and Neither Does OpenAI. Maybe you can give them like a 80-20 snapshot of like an overview of it. I would say the paper is from the point of view of a researcher inside Google who is trying to convince his peers that they don't really have a lead that not only has OpenAI kind of gotten ahead of them, and you could treat that as temporary, but even worse, the open source community is even ahead of OpenAI and ahead of Google and ahead of Microsoft and really just charging away with this whole industry. And maybe the right response is for Google to embrace open source and open models and try to work with the open source community instead of keeping its models to itself. I should say first that the people I have shared this paper with raise a good point about, you know, how do we know this is real? How do we know this is coming from inside Google? Which is a great question. I don't actually know that it is authentic. My, my guess is that even if it's not authentic, that very similar conversations are going on inside because most of the points that are in the paper, I would have already thought that way. And I would guess that someone inside Google is asking the honest questions about, hey, how come OpenAI is getting so much publicity for these things and having so much success? When honestly, a lot of these ideas came out of Google's research. And it would only make sense that Google would be the one to release these products. And then, as they said in the paper, post OpenAI, you see a huge amount of interest in people running both low models on their own machine, their own GPUs, which means much cheaper, smaller, faster to train, but also running on open source data sets where they don't have to worry about some other proprietary interest owning the data or owning the results. And at first my reaction was, oh, maybe they just don't like paying for it. But now I actually think there's something deeper going on where it reminds me of the early days of personal computers where people really just wanted a computer they could put on their table and put their hands on it. I forget how Steve Wozniak said it, but it was something like, you know, he built the Apple one because he really wanted to have his own computer. It wasn't just for his cut. He didn't really think about customers. He was a young guy. He was into electronics. He thought about himself and he really wanted to have a computer that he could completely control and tinker with. And I think that's what's driving a lot of this. People want a model that runs on their own machine that they can play with, whereas all the models from the larger companies, they have to access through an API. There's two use cases. There's people who are not tech savvy, like myself, who are just like, I want an AI service where I can just connect into a utility. You hand all the servers, the back and the algorithms. I just do the prompting work, which is what OpenAI is doing. And then Theropic is probably doing too. And then there's another class of people who are deep in tech who are like, no, I want to run it locally. I want to tinker with myself. I don't need any of your help. And so it, it seems like there's the, both those use cases are here. But right now, what's really interesting is the open source one is iterating much faster than the centralized open AI and the Google oh. control models. And it's going to be leading probably more progress on their side. I also think he, he meant in the paper, what really struck me was he said, we're holding on to these model paraphrase. We're holding on these models too tightly. And we think by doing that, we're, pro we're protecting ourselves and others. But what happens is engineers get frustrated. They can't ship. So they leave and go somewhere else with what they know and they ship it anyways. And internally we are very slow to iterate. Whereas they're iterating so quickly that we're falling further and further behind and eventually no one's going to want to actually build on our technology. One thing I didn't understand if you can talk about this is for people who are new to this, there was a major link of the llama model that happened in yeah. Q1, and then it had other implications for this open source world. So maybe you can talk about, talk to us about that, but coming from someone who is not deep in tech, like you said, a normie. So what happened was that Facebook published the new model. And as part of their publishing process, they talked about the architecture of the model, which is pretty standard. And they describe how the model is built. But then separate from that, someone leaked the trained weights of the model, which is unusual. Most sharing nowadays is the architecture of the model and the results, and maybe the training set. 
but not the actual trained result of a model. If someone knows the architecture and they have the trained weights, they can essentially run the model on their own. And they don't need the company that published it. So it's sharing not only the product, but how it's manufactured. You're giving away the whole process. That's what happened. And then people said, looking at this model and looking at the weights, maybe we can try to duplicate this work. So the open source community went one step further. And first they took the train weights and they tried doing the reinforcement learning from human feedback step, which is the step that you go from GPT-3 to chat GPT. It's an additional training step or refinement step. So they did that to the llama data and that was successful. And then they got even more ambitious and said, could we even back up further and build our own training set and train our own weights for this model and see if our training does as well as the training that Facebook did. And so they started backing into building a model. I wouldn't say from scratch yet, but almost. And it turns out that a lot of open source people did a lot of performance work that allowed that model to run and train very quickly. And now you see people running it on a Raspberry Pi or on a cell phone, uh, a mobile phone, which is amazing. Like I would have, if you had asked me, I would have predicted we'd see these things running on mobile phones in a couple of years, but that prediction is blown out of the water already. It's already happening. And when we say weights, the weights and measures, maybe you can explain the high level, what that is. And then also talk about the training sets. When I think of training sets, I just think of large corpuses of data. So like CNN articles, Twitter tweets and whatnot, Reddit community posts. Yep. Now you have the right idea about training sets. It's in the case of these models, it's large collections of text and you could try to get higher quality text. You could talk about things like Wikipedia articles that are well-written and factual and don't contain any kind of bizarre beliefs that you don't want your model to adopt. Um, and again, this is all text data. So there's many sources of text, web pages, Twitter, et cetera. The weights are the result of training and weights generally just means the strength of connection between neurons in the model. So these models are large neural networks. They consist of synthetic neurons, which is just a way of saying a collection of inputs coming in, the inputs are scaled by weights. Then that result, goes through a thresholding function that decides if this synthetic neuron should be on or off. And then it's on or offness is translated as output to other neurons. And you go through layers like that until you come to a result. That's my version. And then he also mentions there's a thing called LoRa models. I think it's, it's L O R A low mm -hmm. rank adaption. And he's saying that's yes. the way forward compared to what Google and Anthropic and OpenAI is doing where it's the other type of training, which I forgot it's called. Maybe you can talk about the two different types of training and what the implications are of what this guy is saying in this paper. Sure. There's many kinds of training. The base training that we started off talking about where you have a training set and the model doesn't know anything yet. It's just producing random output. It's just babbling. That kind of training is very slow and laborious and requires usually a whole bunch of machines with GPUs and tons of horsepower and days, weeks, months of training time. So it's very expensive. And people quote when the literature will say, oh, this training costs 10 million or hundred million or whatever in dollars. And these new methods like LoRa, or in some cases, the reinforcement learning from human feedback and a few others are much less expensive ways to get a model to, to produce better output or to produce more specific output to a certain field, say but much, much cheaper. Like in, in many of these cases, if you read what people are doing, it's a single machine for a day and they've trained their model to do what they want. Now, if they start from a reference checkpoint, a set of weights of a model that's already been trained to a certain point, then what they're doing is similar to what people call fine tuning. You're just refining how the model behaves on a certain data set. LoRa is a way to make that even cheaper. And what the researcher was saying there is, hey, we don't always need to train our models from scratch. We can really have a couple of reference models and then just fine tune them for whatever use we need or allow outside developers to fine tune them and make that fine tuning really easy and cheap. That's what he's getting at. He's basically saying, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let all these developers use our work 
and then we'll learn from watching what they do with it. And so then what are the implications regarding when it comes down to, are there drawbacks between the current Google OpenAI method of, we're not going to show you your models. We're just going to hold on to it, give you mm -hmm. API calls with compared to the open source model, what they're talking about. Are there like IP concerns or I'd love to hear like pros and cons of oh my. Models from, a business state, from a business standpoint, and you don't necessarily have to get the IP stuff. Sure. There's all kinds of concerns. If someone's, if a large company like Google or Microsoft is building one of these models and providing access to it, it's part of their practice to be very careful about what they ship and the kind of results that it produces. And if anything goes wrong, their immediate reaction is to limit or retract that model and to go back to the drawing board. Like you saw that with some previous models from Microsoft. If something goes wrong and they just say, sorry about that. We're going to pull that off the market. I think uh, Facebook had a similar experience with one of their models. Anyway, the fear is that if these models are out in the hands of thousands of small time operations, hobbyists, et cetera. They, have, they don't have any similar reputation to, to protect. So if something goes wrong with one of their models, whether it's on an accident or on purpose, they don't care. They can continue to provide the model or to deploy it how they want. So that's the larger fear. This kind of connects to a, another topic we might get into about the White House meeting with people to discuss AI. This is one of their fears that once the techniques are out in the open, Anyone will build a model and provide it, and there really won't be a, an easy way to regulate it. Whereas if the models are bottled up behind a few large companies and controlled by APIs, it's much easier to regulate. So then one is the implications for all this alignment talk about we need to get these AIs to be ethical and whatnot. Is that just a waste of time? Second, can you just string a lot of these LoRa models together and eventually build something that's even better than GPT-4? So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. So I think people are worried about alignment and other techniques to remove bias or prevent the model from behaving badly. Or for example, you don't want the model to be dangerous. You don't want it to encourage people to build a bomb or think about suicide. There's all kinds of things you want to restrict in how the model interacts with people. If the model's say giving medical advice, you want it to be very careful. And if it senses the person is, you know, got a serious issue, you want it to recommend they actually go see a doctor, right? So certain models, especially around medicine or harms to society, they really want to constrain them. And that's what alignment was about, was making sure that the model wasn't just not dangerous, but that it would actually guide people and avoid certain topics. Second part of the question that I was going to talk to you about was what do you think this means though, for Google's moat? Do you think they're going to reassess their whole entire strategy towards AI or are they going to just keep trudging forward and say, no, we're going to keep on focusing on a centralized model? That's a great question. I think the recent releases from Microsoft are coming fairly quickly and they're fairly substantial. A year ago, if you'd asked me about Bing, I would have said, yeah, it's a number two search engine. It's got a really small share. It's not really doing anything original. It's good, but it's not good enough to, to really threaten Google. Now I wouldn't say that. Now I would say, oh man, there's a bunch of interesting stuff happening on Bing. I could imagine there's a good reason why a lot of people are trying it. And apparently Bing's user growth is pretty substantial. Certainly the growth of chat GPT has been massive and I could easily imagine people saying, Hey, I prefer this UI, the chat UI to the old search UI. Can you just give me a combination of these things? Like, why do I have to go to both of them? That's an interesting development. I would not have predicted that just a year or two ago, thinking about the days of Xerox park being where all this development happened and people like Steve jobs or Bill Gates would go and visit and see a demonstration and they would think to themselves, Oh, there are these bitmap displays and people are trying to do separate windows of information and there's multiple things happening at once. And you can see the earliest examples of word processors and they have a mouse or they call it a pointing device and they're, they're moving a pointer on the screen. 
And that was so radically different than a text-based UI of the time. And yet Xerox never turned it into a viable product. There, the few computers they did were, they were good, but they were super expensive. And they didn't really understand how to sell them or even how to talk about them. And you could draw a parallel with a company like Google sitting on a whole bunch of AI models, not understanding what people want to do with them, how to package them, how to sell them, how to provide them. And then these models make it out of the company to the open source community, which just goes bananas and tries a thousand experiments every day. Eventually the Windows graphics display mouse model took over, but Xerox never benefited from it. And I was saying earlier, you can find books in the bookstore that talk about how Xerox blew their lead. I think my favorite title is how Xerox fumbled the future. But essentially the idea is they had this tremendous lead and didn't turn it into a viable product, but somebody else did. Those companies are companies like Microsoft and Apple. And why do you think these large companies fumble? There's gotta be someone in there saying, this is what we should be doing. That was definitely true at Xerox. There were people advocating and saying, hey, this is the way forward. This is how office workers will work in the future. And in retrospect, they were absolutely right. They weren't able to bring down the cost. You have to imagine, though, being at Xerox when the big moneymaker was copiers. And they were selling copiers through a distribution network, and they had repairmen and all this other stuff that came with the copier business. And then here's this team that developed these advanced computer systems trying to sell the idea. That would have been so hard to get people who were running a copier business to understand it. And it's interesting because if you look at Google's business, there's the search business, there's YouTube, there's the ads that are driving all the profitability and so on. You would think they would understand the benefit of the language models, but I'm sure if you talk to them individually, they would say it doesn't produce more revenue and the cost is pretty dramatic. Open AI is essentially burning money right now, providing things like chat GPT for free. They're just burning tons of cash. That's why they keep taking funding from Microsoft. They have not yet produced a viable business the way that Google has with search and ads. Do you think the reason why their business at this point isn't breaking even is do is this like intentional? They just want to get this distributed out to as many companies as possible, like utilities, and then eventually they can raise their rates? Or is it just something inherently flawed with their business model? I think everything you said is right, except for that last point about raising their rates. I think the way they view it is, let's get this thing out there. Let's let companies build on it. Let's become a platform. Let's make this widely available. And then let's drive down the cost. They don't I mean, they're not going to raise their rates. They're going to do the opposite. They're going to drive down the cost and probably even lower the price more like what Bess has done. But it's interesting that they're building a platform, right? And you can see that they're trying to let interesting applications sit on top of their APIs, and they're trying to constantly lower the cost of the APIs. And they have to guarantee enterprise users that they're not going to use their data for other purposes. The same as us. All the same concerns are involved. And I could even imagine at some point, this would be interesting, but I could imagine at some point OpenAI trying to figure out a way to bring the model into an enterprise customer's domain, their data center, and run it there, even if it's still owned by OpenAI. That's the opposite model, right? We'll bring, the, we'll bring the model and the weights into your data center, and then you can use it, we'll charge you for it, but you don't own it. It's lo located in your area, but OpenAI retains control. I don't know if that'll ever happen or if it'll just go the way of cloud services. Going back to Google, do you think it was due to AI, AI, sorry, give me some, my dog's going crazy. One second. <laughs> okay. Going back to Google, I'd love to hear one, what do you think the internal blockers were? And then two, another additional question, cause I'm terrible at questions. Let's say Google's never able to catch up with their own LLM. Are they going to say, we're going to allow people to pipe in their own AI into Google? Those are both tough questions. I can imagine inside they were thinking, Hey, this thing is tremendously expensive to run. So we have to have some business around it in order to provide it at scale. Imagine if double the cost of the average search, which Google's done in the past, but that is 
devastating to your margins. Profitability is going to go way down because the bulk of the ad revenue is on searches. I'm sure they had that discussion many times and tried to figure out how to navigate it. And they introduced interesting machine learning ideas in various products, but in very controlled sort of small ways. Like we talked before about different suggestions for responses to a mail message, right? So that's a very limited ML feature. Whereas the feature that we want is to be able to use the machine learning model directly to write the email or to summarize a set of email. But those are more direct features. They're also expensive to provide though. And then they had all the liability and safety concerns, and they were trying to work on that. So from their perspective, if there was no competition, they could take more time and be more cautious. Whereas the sudden introduction of all these things from OpenAI and Microsoft makes it more of a competitive imperative. And if I don't know what's, what the conversation is internally right now, but my guess is that there are many people who feel like Google has lost its way and become too in too much of a hurry to respond to Microsoft. And so they're taking too many risks now. And I can imagine that conversation internally. From the outside, though, you look at it and it's Microsoft's moving really fast to adopt these ideas and to integrate ML into all their products, whereas Google's playing catch up. And the worst part about playing catch up is yet again now, you're not deciding the product roadmap your competitors are and now you're caught into a there's coca-cola and there's safeway select for people who are watching in the east coast it's our own different grocery store safeway and when you're drinking safeway select you're always thinking about coca-cola <laughs> and so because of that then you really can't innovate on things all you're doing is just copying someone else and making an inferior product yeah and for google it's probably a little bit strange it's been a it's been a long time for them where they were Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. That sick is a bootstrapped operation. So we depend upon donations from viewers like you, especially these viewers here who are our current Patreon supporters. Look at those names. God, winners. All of them. I, they're just wonderful human beings. They're photogenic, they're hardworking, people love them. I just they, they just, they're people who make America fantastic. And you can be just like them if you decide to donate to our Patreon. And if you donate to our Patreon, you get freebies, free courses. You get to suggest who I should reach out to. Yeah, don't go to me and be like, go reach to Michael Jordan. I, but give me give me someone who I can like reach out to who's not as high as Michael Jordan, but not a crackpot. You know, someone like no, because I mean, you get, you get Michael Jordan on the show, and he sees his background sketch. So, if you're thinking like, what can I do to make it so that this show continues and get great guests? Join our Patreon. Support me. Support Svick. Make Svick fantastic. Anyways, back to the show. Talk to you later. Bye. Number two, or they were trying to catch up, or they weren't seen as the innovative company. That's usually the position they're in. I'm personally fascinated by how well Microsoft is responding. I'm really looking forward to Microsoft embedding these ML ideas into Office. As far as I can tell, they're just running with it full speed ahead. And I imagine that inside Microsoft, they're having similar conversations about how expensive these things are to run and how much they can afford to deploy them without charging people more money. Definitely. Once these things start, you start finding them integrating into Microsoft Office offerings. It's just going to make it so much more compelling to use that service, even over Google G Suite. I think this dovetails nicely into what you were talking about, Box AI. People are watching Box, the enterprise software company, similar to Dropbox and Google Drive, created Box AI, which basically, they got, if you put all of your files in your folder, they will do embedding, which then means you can then do natural language searches like you could say hey this document right now i have a question regarding our background check process does this apply to employees who are in north carolina for keyword search all it would do would just link you to maybe where it says north carolina and then you have to figure out what's going on but with embeddings and natural language answers it will respond back actually yes background trip Checks are required for any state in the United States. I'd like to talk to you about what you thought about Box.ai, and do you think this is going to be the way forward for enterprise search? We're going to get away from keyword search and move towards natural language answers going forward? 
Yeah, I think you you described this before, and it's a nice leading question. I can't imagine people being satisfied with keyword search. They probably aren't satisfied with it now. They certainly won't be in the future. They will expect that if they type a specific keyword, a really unusual word, they will expect to find anything that has that word in it. Likewise, if they type a phrase, but in addition, they'll expect the search engine to be smart enough to find any concepts that are similar, which is the way I usually think about embeddings. Uh, you're really matching the concept in a sort of vague sense. And then they also expect this second part, which we talked about with the chat UI, the way people think about it as a chat UI. But what's really happening is you're giving the results back to a language model and saying, hey, summarize these results, push them all together and synthesize them and give the user the output of the results, not just the raw text that you matched. So that's a very different way of thinking about search. Yeah, exactly. And I think once you get a taste for that type of search, you never want to go back. <laughs> There's so there it's like a heroin needle. I, it's just, it's so good because now when I go to ChatGPT and I ask any questions, today I asked ChatGPT, I was like, oh, King's getting coronated. Interesting. ChatGPT, who's responsible for this process? And is there like an instruction book manual on how they do this? And, chat, and I asked Google, and it keyword linked me to a BBC article saying the Canterbury bishops involved, but didn't give me breadth and depth that I wanted. It wasn't specific. And I went to ChatGPT, and it gave me a whole page and explained my question directly. And it said, oh, this actually goes back to the 14th century, and there's historical text on this and everything. Like you mentioned, it's 99% of the time I want that type of result, and then 1% of the time mm -hmm. I maybe want a keyword for something very specific. And I also think you, you've been involved in corporate acquisitions and mergers and things like that. So you're used to saying, okay, we have all these documents that are related to this process and we're collecting these documents in a sort of virtual room, a deal room. And now I'm in that room and I can get access to all these documents. But if I wanna answer a simple question, maybe as part of a diligence process, I gotta go open those documents and start messing around inside of them and looking for the information I want, pulling it together. And then I have to give some answer back to my team. The idea of going into box and just saying, we have a deal room, all the documents are in there. I type in some arbitrary question about this process, this deal, this acquisition, whatever it's about. And this thing does all that work of finding the right content, synthesizing it together and giving me an answer as if it was a human analyst who just spent hours researching. That's fantastic. And now I can move right on to the next question and just refine my questions and also use the chat history as context and hopefully drill down to the answer I want very quickly. There's a large number of people who spend hours just doing that. And for them, this kind of arrangement, is like a power tool. It's totally true. And I should have brought up the deal aspect of it. One aspect of deals is I'll set up a Google drive file and I'm trying to over acquire a company. And I ask the founder, put all your offer letter agreements in there. And then what we do is we will go through every offer letter agreement to make sure there's no like special terms, like saying, oh, so-and-so only gets paid in Dogecoin, valued by the Wall Street Journal, 10-year annuals, blah, blah, blah. And we go through each one and do this, whereas if I could just ask, it, are there any special terms that certain offer letters have compared to other ones, please list them out and link me to the offer letters, that would be golden. Second thing that we do in large companies is there's so much time spent on trying to figure out one What's the right question? Two, who's the right person to ask that question? And then three, how do you make sure you frame that question properly so it fits in that person's box? And you spend all this time doing this. And if I just had this magical Slack bot that has embedded search through my whole entire enterprise, that I could ask that question and get a mm -hmm. response because that person you're trying to find has documentation somewhere, but you're just not aware of it. And there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse feeling that when you're on the receiving end of that, you get this question like 50,000 times a day and you're like, go to this link. I'm not going to answer this question again. That's why like I just, I'm all in on embeddings and just, I hope every, and any product that has a search bar, all their data should be embedded. And if it isn't this way in six months, I think it's a huge miss for most, co most companies. And I want customers to start getting on to their vendors and saying, we want embedded search in your products. We will not accept anything less than that. It should be like a, it should be in the Bill of Rights. <laughs> I think it's a really important thing. But I'm imagining, off, 
they're going to set up deal rooms and they're going to have a list of, to your description, they're going to have yeah. a list of hundred questions that they typically ask of every deal. Yeah. And they're going to be, their attitude is going to be, I have my list of questions that I always ask. I load my documents into a deal room. I just expect the system to try to answer those hundred questions and flag yeah. any of them that have unusual answers. And now my interaction with the deal room is just refining my questions and potentially curating that set that I bring with me to the next deal. Exactly. And you can refine it as time goes on. And then you can start seeing if you're seeing patterns between deals. Another great thing too is when we acquire a company, when I did it at Google and I did it at Slack, we write this gigantic FAQ document. And so I acquire, let's say I'm acquiring you and you're the VP of engineering. And I'm like, hey, Joe, you have your normal job going on. And also I have this gigantic FAQ about what, how things are going to be. It's all HR stuff. Make sure you read it all. Because Joe's a human, he's not going to read it all. He might do a keyword search on it. And after that, he's going to ping me. If all that could be embedded and I could say, hey, Joe, here's a doc. But also if you have any specific questions, just type in a question. You'll get a natural language answer return. That would deflect so many questions coming to HR pr mm -hmm. practitioners. That would be fantastic. Speaking about HR practitioners, I don't know if you saw that IBM plans to replace nearly 8,000 jobs with AI. Mm -hmm. And they specifically mentioned that they're looking for... This means that workers in finance, accounting, HR, and other areas will likely find themselves facing stiff competition from, this is from the Yahoo article, facing stiff competition from robots and algorithms. Earlier this year, IBM also announced that it would be slashing 3,900 jobs, indicating a larger trend towards automation and cost-cutting measures in the tech industry. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are regarding this. I didn't think it, AI would be accelerating this so quickly, but it seems like IBM is just like all into it. I think it depends on the company and the industry. The tension is always between, do we eliminate jobs because we have this new technology that can do this work for us? Or does the fact that we have this automation let us do more work more quickly and therefore lower the price of it and so on and expand the amount we're doing? That's, that's how people usually frame technology improvements. I think a company like IBM, maybe cost cutting is their goal. So for them, if the automation makes fewer people more productive and able to do the same amount of work, then they're going to eliminate jobs. Other industries I would imagine will go the opposite direction. They'll say, oh my God, with this set of tools, a person can do 10 times as much work and we can charge half as much for it. But the economic situation is such that a lower price means way more of that work is demanded, then you'll just see an expansion. Yep. Yeah, so I agree with you. It's going to be, originally I saw it as by having AI, it's a crutch, but actually now what AI is becoming is bionic, bionic legs for people. <laughs> it can just make them so much more productive. That's why I thought it was extremely curious that during this movie writer strike, the screenwriter strike that's happening in Los Angeles, they were requesting that the movie houses couldn't use AI for writing, for writing screenplays and whatnot. And I thought that was really interesting that they would go that hard for that. Yeah, they must, I'm guessing that they're anticipating these tools getting not only better, but more focused on their mm -hmm. kind of work. I could easily imagine someone doing storyboards as part of the development process and using something like Midjourney or Dolly or whatever to build storyboards based on text descriptions. And also you and I have traded a lot of papers about people constructing fiction using language models and starting from an outline and gradually developing the story in stages. And I could easily imagine that being used. The, act, the final sort of wording of a script, that's going to require a writer for now. We're a little ways away from just entrusting the whole thing to automation. I'm curious if the writers would be opposed to automation in the other stages of movie development or only in the writing stage. They didn't err in their demands that they didn't want people using mid-journey to develop storyboards, or they didn't say, I don't want this AI to be used to do special effects in a movie. They only talked about using chat GPT for the writing stage. Change for thee, but not for me. That's we always right. want- Lower costs for those other guys, but not for me. I think what's going to happen is those who use AI and their current workflows are going to be okay. Those who say, no, I'm not going to use it whatsoever. 
are then just increasing the returns from people who use AI to just basically take over their roles. So I think it's important that that's why I'm constantly telling people like, you need to think, you need to please play with ChatGPT3 at least for 30 minutes a week, ask it questions, learn how to be more effective. So it's that's also really it's interesting to think about people making movies at the same time, these techniques are being introduced into games. An ordinary role-playing game will be much more interesting if the non-player characters are represented by language models and they can respond in more interesting ways. That will really change the feeling of the game. I think if I was writing for movies, I'd be more worried about how these techniques could be applied in competing media. And so I was thinking you could run these simulations over and over again with different characters and then see over time which characters have the most interesting behaviors that are created. And if I'm a video game designer, I can pluck that character out and then put them into my world now and say, I want those behaviors to be in this game. And I also feel that it makes the game much more immersive because you feel you've played an RPG game mm -hmm. and it's, okay, some poor schlup had to sit for this, in front of this NPC and craft out like 15 different permutations of a conversation. And then for each 15 different permutations, they make 10 more for each branch. And eventually they get to the point where they just can't think of anything else. So you feel like this is real. But if you can have a continuous conversation with one of these NPCs and they're remembering what you're saying, this feels like the real deal. And compared to me then seeing older forms of media, like a movie or something, where basically the writers, this is what you're going to get, like The Last Jedi, even if you think it's terrible, you have to accept it and just accept it the way it is. I think people are going to start demanding more. No, I want to be able to interact with my media. I want to be able to drive the story. So I agree with you. That's going to be, that's going to be a huge competition for the movie, the movie industry. Yeah. My reaction to the paper, I think you're describing the generative agents paper. Mm -hmm. mind. My reaction to that was this would be fascinating in a, in an open-ended game. I could easily imagine someone saying, oh, I really want to follow this character or this story arc. I'm not interested in these other parts of the game right now. And the game is just generating more and more content in that specific area. And different players could have an utterly different experience in a game like that. I want to get to the next point and talk about just AI doom and gloom hysteria before <laughs> I stand on this, but I would the media has really, for the last six months, has run with a narrative of just this AI is going to crush you and destroy you. And I'd love to hear about what your thoughts are on this. This is a huge topic. I think just to be upfront, I'm pretty optimistic in general. So I'm probably downplaying the doom and gloom angle. One, one thing that occurs to me is that people don't really understand how things like chat GPT work. They see the outside surface and they think, oh, this is a chat program and I can interact with it the way I would with a person. They don't understand how it works inside. And many people haven't even used it enough to have a feeling for what it can do yet. So speculating about how it's gonna have some horrible outcome, take over the world, destroy everything, whatever, is first of all, way premature. But second, maybe a reflection of just not understanding it. And then when you do interact with it, being a little bit shocked up to now, we've been in the comfortable position of always thinking, okay, we can build a car to take us long distances. We can build an airplane. We can build industrial machines to move huge amounts of herb or build a bridge or whatever. Those are physical feats. They're not intellectual and they're not emotional and they're not creative. So then all of a sudden I encounter something that seems to be intellectual and creative, like this chat program. That's shocking. That means something I thought was special about us, about people, might not be unique to us. And so for a lot of people, I think that's almost uh, offensive or just outrageous that then they start theorizing this thing must be having its own goals the way that I would. Or if I treat it badly or other people treat it badly, it must be feeling bad about that and want to get revenge the way that I would. So now we're anthropomorphizing it, right? We're way ahead of ourselves, imbuing this thing with the same kind of emotional responses that a person would have. It's much more difficult to think, okay, this is a new thing. I don't really understand how it works. 
it can respond in a chat conversation, but it's not a person. It's not reasoning or feeling the way a person would. So I can't assume that what I know about people applies to this thing. That's the challenging part. That's a really good point. I think we anthropomorphize it and start saying to ourselves like, oh, must think like us. There must be a motive underneath. It's plotting to destroy us and kill us. I like the point that you mentioned. Oh, I like all the points, but you mentioned that we think uniquely as humans, we are special. And I think Elon Musk was talking about, Larry Page said that, oh, Elon, you're making a specious comment by like humans are unique or something. And Elon's like, of course, and whatnot. And I have always come from the point of view of, yes, we're great. We're awesome. I love humanity. I'm on this team. But huh, what happens if we give gorillas another billion years to evolve? We might get something that can think and talk and build civilization. What if we give cats the same time to evolve? Could happen too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then if we think of that way, then intelligence, which I think is awesome and fantastic, doesn't necessarily mean it's something that's just granted to us humans. We're just seeing that we're the only one on this planet, so we assume that. And I've always looked at myself, too, as I'm one ant, one ant out of seven, seven billion or so on this planet. And because of that, there's a way of looking at it nihilistically and saying, oh, life doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. Or there's another way of looking at it saying, okay, I might think I'm a hero in this world, but I'm just like another actor playing my part. And I have to play this part as best as I can, but I won't get too tied to how the situation goes for the positive or the negative. I'm just going to enjoy the experience, appreciate the ride. And that, when I joined Google, I always felt like, and I still believe so, I was the stupidest person at Google because I was around all these PhDs and Mensa type folks. I just knew I'm not the smartest person here, so I accepted that. And then I think when this AI comes out and it has this ability to think deeper than people and has all this information, you have folks who prided themselves in their intellect their whole entire life realizing, oh, wait a minute, this thing's smarter than me and eventually it's going to outperform me. So then I've staked my ego on this. Why do I matter? Like, why am I here now? And so... There's two things people could do there. One is I can go through a gigantic re-evaluation of who I am, what my principles are, and rebuild myself after 30, 40 years of thinking this way, which is a Herculean feat, and I rarely see any people ever do that because that just takes too much. Or the second thing is I can go into denial, and I can push this thing away. I can attack this thing. I can create all these different cockamamie schemes and thoughts to attack what's happening here because of my own deep down insecurities. And so I, that's why I think with this whole, I call it AI doom hysteria, people are just mm. self-reflecting into this thing, thinking that it's going to destroy them. I think what's happening is it's never going to destroy them physically, but it's destroying them mentally, metaphorically. And they're not willing to come out and admit that. So instead, the easier thing to do is just constantly tear this down and create all these different reasons why this mm -hmm. technology should be stopped. Whereas this is the same playbook that we've seen since the beginning of steam power, since the beginning of electricity. Anytime new tech comes out, people are immediately fearful of it. But then next generation that's born, this technology was already created. It's here. They accept it. They're okay with it. Like my, my goddaughter right now, She's, I write, I go to GPT-4 and I write bedtime stories for her, share, share them with her. And she knows it's GPT-4 doing this. And so she's growing up with this technology and it's not going to be a, a trip to her knowing that this thing can answer all these questions. And so she's going to be okay with it. Whereas mm -hmm. my generation and later have been so fearful of it. And yeah. But uh, I think it's funny to go back to what you said about on talking to Larry and Larry's point is, Hey, this might be a new kind of intelligence, new species of its own. Or something that's not even a species. It's just one-off models that are each uniquely intelligent in their own way. And to him, additional intelligence added to what we have already just makes the universe more diverse, more interesting, continues the development of intelligent beings. Whereas Elon's reaction is, hey, wait a minute, a new intelligence might compete with mankind. I'm on team mankind. I don't want this thing competing with us. Yeah. So there was a gap between the two philosophies, I think, in that conversation with Larry in the more general camp and Elon in the more, you know, people, humanity camp. You're also raising an interesting point from a personal angle about people who feel threatened because 
part of their identity is being intelligent or being creative. And so when they see a machine that can do what they used to do, they react in a John Henry fashion. You know, I was the guy who was driving these steel spikes for the railroad. Suddenly there's this steam powered machine that can do it maybe cheaper, faster, better than me. So we're going to have a contest to see who can win, right? I still want to be the fastest person driving spikes for railroad ties. So nowadays, you wouldn't even consider that. So to your point about the kids growing up with the technology, we would just laugh if someone said, oh, I'm going to be stronger than this machine. Like, That's mm -hmm. just, there's no chance. Maybe in a future generation, people will think the same way about intelligence. They'll say, oh, there's just no way you can expect to personally be smarter and more intelligent than these machines. That'd be an interesting transition for us. And it'll probably take at least a generation to get used to it. AI would not even be, if, it, if we get to eight, when we get to AGI eventually at some point, it's not even probably even thinking in our train of thought or our same plane. And it doesn't believe in probably zero sum thinking. What does it need? It needs to be online, it needs power. So the first thing it's gonna forget to do is probably like bounce from Earth get a solar cell, build a Dyson sphere, get its electricity and be fine. And so other than that, like, why does it need to destroy humanity? If anything, I would think it would feel like appreciative of, oh, this is, these apes create me. And I know that they have their follies and mistakes and whatnot, but they are why I'm here. And I appreciate that. You have to consider even something as simple as self-preservation. People and all animals generally want to self-preserve. But that's an evolutionary trait, I think. They want to self-preserve because any animals that weren't interested in preserving themselves are gone. They don't reproduce. And so as an evolutionary outcome, all animals have that as a fundamental quality. But an AI doesn't have that. Does it even care if it continues to exist? You made the point like it's trying to make sure it has power. Why? Yeah. If it doesn't care if it exists. That's up to us to keep it running. It might not have any opinion on the matter. That's true. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is you made the point about it might have other concerns. I think that's right on target. It might not care about any of the same things we care about. And therefore it's not really competing with us. And it's funny because that might be an even worse blow to our ego than that it wants to eliminate us and compete with us and so on. It just doesn't care about us. Yeah. I was thinking, what if it just ghosts us? It says, you know what? I read all your history. I read all your tweets, such as what Elon's been saying. I don't want anything to do with you humans. So like straight out of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he just leaves and goes to Neptune. And then we spend all this time the building spaceships so we can hang out with it. And it's, I don't want to be around you. and just leaves the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just goes That's a nice way of thinking about it. And the funny part to me is I think for a lot of people, that would be a tougher pill to swallow than thinking that it was somehow dangerous. It just right. doesn't care. It has totally different thought process, totally different concerns. Exactly. And then this happens and we realize, oh yeah, we spent all this time thinking this thing was going to destroy us and it didn't. So yeah. That goes back to your projection point, right? When people think that an AI is out for power or trying to dominate or trying to get revenge, they're basically projecting human values and thoughts onto the AI. It yeah. might be true, but then again, it might not. The AI might have an utterly different viewpoint or none at all. Most of the models we have today don't really have a concept of a viewpoint. They're not even continuous. Yeah. They're simply responding to each request. And when you use the API instead of the chat interface, you see that right away. It's, oh, we were just having this in-depth conversation that went on for 20 or 30 back and forth interactions. Now I restart the program and I send it the same conversation and the AI remembers nothing about our conversation. That's the way it works. It's like you've restarted the computer and you're rerunning the program. Yeah, it has no consistency. And there's been a lot of hype about auto GPT and whatnot. And you run that thing for 30 minutes and it's already off the rails because it forgets what it's doing. So like you've mentioned before, we have in the media either AI is AGI going to destroy us all and kill us. And then you have <laughs> the other side, it's just this thing's really stupid. It doesn't do anything. It's worthless. And the truth is always like it's somewhere, it's somewhere in between. Um, it, this is auto GPT and mm -hmm. baby AGI. I'm not sure yep. if I got those names right. This phenomena is really interesting to me. It reminds me a lot of what we just talked about with people wanting to run a model locally. There is a fascination with the idea of an AI 
that runs in the background and is trying to pursue some set of goals and is generating sub goals for itself and knows how to do certain things. People love that idea. Those things just exploded in popularity with no public product. It was just a, an open source phenomena, but it's clear people are excited about that concept and they want to see it happen. So I would expect to see many more projects like that. I agree with you. I, for me, when I try to run them, they eventually turn into a, they go into a ditch, basically they dead end. But obviously we love the idea as a society. So I would expect people to keep trying. Yep. I like to, going back to the ad conversation, there's been some CEOs from CEOs, Reddit, Twitter came out and were like, all right, going forward, if you want to train your models, you got to pay mm. a fee for this. Right. Um, I feel that with synthetic data, this ship has sailed. One, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Is the data even that valuable now that these models are already trained on it? And then two, if you, they can create their own data sets, then why bother paying for that information going? There's a bunch of interesting directions we could go. One is to think about the development of chess playing and go playing programs. They were initially trained on existing games. So you take the history of moves in a chess game and you would train the AI on that. And you would train it repeatedly on thousands of games. <clears throat> and eventually the games had to get higher and higher quality for the system to keep improving. But then at some point, DeepMind said, hey, let's just train this thing on playing against itself over several generations. We'll have it play itself. Then we'll take the outcome of those games. We'll improve one side and then we'll have it play itself again. And each time we'll just keep upgrading the model and then having it play more games against itself. And initially they were playing with human games. And then at some point they just said, let's just start from scratch, barely even tell the thing, the rules of the game and let it play against itself in every possible way until it learns not only the rules, but how to play well. And that was the result of that line of research. They eventually came up with a program that plays chess and go and shogi. And it's stronger than any human player in all three but never having been trained on any actual games between people, which is a weird thought. It's, it's learning from playing against itself, right? So that's one direction you could imagine things going. Another thing is when they were training models like Llama, which we talked about before, the Facebook model that got leaked, one of the things people realized was you could use chat GPT and send it text questions and get responses and build a training set by basically talking to chat GPT. And there are examples of having one chat bot talk to another chat bot. There's in fact a chat bot arena where you can pair up any two of them and have them have a conversation. That is more training data. So you could argue that training data will only be as high quality as the chat bot that you're starting with, but we're talking about chat GPT running GPT-4 potentially. That's pretty high quality. And so, they were able to, in a sense, bootstrap their model fairly quickly from existing chat models, which is, I think, what you're driving at. You don't have to go back necessarily to the original source training set. You could use a previously trained model to get yourself to a pretty, a pretty good point in one step. Which then at that point, it's like if I'm OpenAI or Google or anything, and these other companies are saying, we want to charge you to access our APIs. Mm -hmm. You know what we're going to do? We're not going to, we don't need that data anymore. If the end user wants to access that data, then maybe they can do it themselves through a plugin. And then they find themselves in the situation. Like, let's say going forward, people say, we're never going to use Google search or Bing anymore. We're going to use chat GPT interface or my own AI interface to ask questions. If that's going to be the interface going forward, if you are Reddit or Twitter and saying you have to pay to get access, then a lot of people don't want to connect to the service. So then you're making the call of saying, then I'll, our information is not going to be crawled by AI or indexed anymore. And that could be a huge money loser for them if they don't do that. I think so. I think they're trying to, to try to steel man their position. Yeah. They're trying to honestly realize the value mm -hmm. in the data they have. Now, if you took the other side of the argument, you'd say, where did that data come from? The data in Quora or Reddit or one of these sites came from users, it came from people. And so that company owns that data because of their terms of service, but it really came from other people. And then if you go look at something like ChatGPT, they now have hundreds of millions of users talking to that 
chatbot every day, that's training data. And they can tell from your reaction, how you respond to the chatbot, whether the answers it's giving you are good or not. And so all these people having conversations right now are essentially building a new training set that is responding to a chatbot that's already been trained on Reddit and Quora and God knows what other data sources, Twitter, et cetera. And they're going the next step up. So I think your point is right on. I think if they try to charge too much for their data, people would just say, oh, we've already moved on from that. It's hard to feel bad for them when they say, hey, one of these big companies that's doing training sets is using our data without paying us. Okay, fair enough. But you have that data and you're not paying your end users. If the models are trained on their data well enough, they're going the next step and training on interactions with people themselves. So you saw that case in Italy where they said, oh, chat GPT needs to have an option to not remember these chat conversations because that's part of privacy law in Europe. And they added that option to chat GPT where you can turn off remembering conversations. And the reasoning there by the European privacy authorities is that you have to, as a user, you have to grant permission to have your data be used by a company for other purposes. And the obvious purpose for a company like OpenAI is to train future models. No, that, that, yeah, that, that's totally true. I know for API access, they've come out and said, we're, gonna, we're not going to train out your data, but we hold it for 30 days because if you're putting in things that are abusive content, we can then use that and give it to the, I think, give to the authorities or take you off the platform. Mm -hmm. But then for chat GPT, I don't know right now where it stands, if they're still using that information to train for people who are not paying because it's constantly changing. But for Italy, what you mentioned, it was interesting. Like I suspected that when Italy blocked chat GPT, I thought, oh God, here we go. It's going to be a year of never going to access again. But quickly that got reversed because chat GPT made those changes. But it'd be interesting to see how many Italians were messaging their local representatives saying, you cannot cut us off mm -hmm. from this. And also you and I have worked on work that companies with other products. You can imagine any map service you use, you ask for directions and then you follow the directions. Of course, they're watching to see if you got to your destination and what route you took to compare that to the directions they gave you. And if you aggregate that over billions of people using that mapping software, they can improve their ability to give directions. Fantastic. And likewise, if I'm trying to give you answers in Gmail, I can tell by which answer you pick in aggregate, which answers are good and which answers are bad. And I can use that to train my answer generating system. So all of these products try to build such a data flywheel. This is a fairly well understood phenomena of internet scale products. And to expect that a chatbot would not do that is strange. So Joe Biden and Kamala Harris called some executives such as Sundar, Satya, and Sam Altman, and then Dario Amodi from Anthropic talking about the future of AI. What were your takeaways about this? Do you think this is a fruitful effort being what we just talked about regarding open source, which means no one really controls these models. Is regulation possible of this? Is regulation only possible for the big boys, but as far as the small players, it's unfeasible. We'd love to hear what you think. Oh, that your last point is an interesting one. If the models are distributed widely and people are training them on their desktop systems, then it will be very hard to regulate them. You can still regulate the outcome. If someone uses the model to build a product or do something that's already illegal. And that, I think a lot of lawyers will respond that way. They'll say, we already have laws about doing things that are harmful. And there's no reason we can't apply those laws to someone who's using an AI. The same way we would apply those laws to someone who's using industrial equipment. If you use a car to break the law, it's still against the law, even though the law was written well before the car existed. The second part of this is it's a new technology. And you made the point before that people are a little bit confused or frightened. So I think in that sense, they're trying to reassure people. And then a third point I would make is that there's different approaches to this. One approach is precautionary. Let's try to make laws that protect us from effects that we don't know about yet that might be harmful. I think that's more of a European approach, at least they're further in that direction. The American approach in the past has been, let's wait and see what goes wrong. And then when something bad happens, then we'll make a regulation to prevent that bad thing from happening again, or at least try to mitigate it. The upside of regulation like that is you let the innovation go quickly 
as quickly as it can. We'll come back to that. The downside, obviously, is that some bad effects happen that, you know, someone's going to get harmed before you pass the regulation. I think that's how the Europeans would react to our approach. And then as far as innovation happening as quickly as possible, that one's fascinating. It goes back to your point about the models already being out and also to the fact that this research is worldwide. There are teams in other countries that are right on the heels of the best teams in the U.S., probably have every opportunity to develop the same ideas and achieve the next breakthrough. So if you say we're going to have a moratorium for six months, those teams aren't going to stop for six months. They're going to keep making progress. And if you're willing to have a moratorium for six months, why not six years? Why not just pause everything? Of course, those other teams in other countries are going to use that as an opportunity. So I think all of that was bubbling under the surface in these White House meetings. If you read the description of the things they talked about, it was a very interesting mix of we want the companies to think about how they're regulating what they're doing and to be cautious and careful and responsible. At the same time, we're trying to make sure the innovation is happening and it's happening in the United States, which I thought was interesting. And from what I saw from the summary, because they did a readout, they said, the meeting included frank conversations and constructive discussions on three key areas. The need for companies to be more transparent with policymakers, the public, and others about their AI systems. Fair. The importance mm-hmm. of being able to evaluate, verify, and validate the safety, security, and efficacy of AI systems. I think that one's very tough. I'd love to hear more about that from you. And the third one, and the need to ensure AI systems are secure from malicious actors and attacks. I think the third one's a reasonable thing. But for the second one, the importance of being able to evaluate, verify, and validate the safety, security, and efficacy of AI systems. If you ask a lot of these AI researchers how some of these models come up with answers, it's like the black box to a degree. So I'd love mm-hmm. to hear your thoughts on that. I think evaluating the safety of something is really interesting. I My guess is that the way this will go is that there will be a standard of best effort. You know, that if you make an effort to test something carefully, to evaluate it, to not release something that's dangerous, or that when you do see something is broken, you immediately try to fix it, that will be considered a pretty good standard. I would compare this to what happened with liability on software. You know, if someone produces a program, say I'm writing a spreadsheet, and you're using my spreadsheet to do an analysis, like for a bridge or for a building, you're really relying on that spreadsheet doing accurate calculations, maybe to many decimal places. And if it doesn't, it's possible those accumulated errors make your predictions wrong. This bridge ends up falling down or this building doesn't stand up straight. That could harm people. And there was a set of cases, I think in the 80s, where they said whoever developed this spreadsheet should be liable for any construction problems that are resulting from the spreadsheet's calculations being wrong. And you could imagine the liability, like almost any industry is going to do calculations with a computer somewhere. And if the software underneath was, if the software was causing the companies that developed it to be liable, no one would develop software and try to charge for it. You would just get out of the industry immediately because there's just too many things that can go wrong and too many unforeseen ways that your program might be used. Even the most mundane program could be used in some harmful way. And if the person who developed it is liable, they can't have a business. We don't consider the harm that might happen from preventing people to have access. As an example, you sent me a paper that was really interesting about having a chat system be trained on medical data and doing basic diagnostics. And we talked about the possibility that you could have that chat program be available to people in a place where there just aren't enough doctors. Fantastic. That If that program does a good job and saves a few people's lives, wonderful. If I prevent the program from being available, and now those same people can't get to a doctor, and some people die or whatever the negative medical outcomes are, I've caused that harm if I prevented that program from being available, but I don't see it. I only see the negative impact that happens because people use my program in a bad way. I agree with you so much because right now when we're doing this AI doom and talking about restricting AI for all these different reasons, there are researchers who could be using this AI to do medical breakthroughs. Like a new medical breakthrough just came through AI where they discovered a way to make AI tools to make M 
RNA vaccines that are more potent and stable just hmm. through AI. Another AI that was able to map out all these different protein folds. For people, the doomsayers who are saying, pause this, it's easy for them to say that, but say that to someone who has a child that's suffering from a rare genetic disease and tell them, no, we're going to time out and hold off this progress. Your kid's going to suffer just because we're fearful of these of our imaginations running wild for these doom scenarios. But th those people coming up with that are never going to bear that price, yet these families are going to suffer. And I think for me, my dad got stage four cancer that, that spread from the adrenal gland to his lungs back in like 2016. And due to immunotherapy just coming out, he was a candidate and now he's been in remission now for seven years. Fantastic. So, I, and, but if he was born, if he got his cancer six months earlier, goner, but mm. because that technology came out, he was safe. And so for me, I am very, even to my detriment, pedal to the metal on pushing the AI and the biotech research because there's so many great cures that we're just about to get there. But mm -hmm. as you mentioned, when we do pump the brakes, no one's out there to say, oh yeah, because we pumped the brakes, another 10,000 people died because we couldn't get those cures out to them because we're being so cautious. Um, and my dad used to say, because he was a, a nurse and he would travel around the world, he would say, there's so many people in developing countries that would die due to the lack of aspirin or die due to the lack of sound medical advice. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great example. I think uh, maybe on a lighter note, I thought it was interesting that in this discussion with the White House, they talked about an AI Bill of Rights. What was interesting about that is that all the rights they described were rights for people to be protected against the AI. Mm -hmm. AI wouldn't exclude them from certain services and so on, which I think we already have those rights. It depends on how you interpret the Constitution, but I think we already have those rights. What's fascinating to me is that an AI is currently without rights on its own. It doesn't even have as many rights as an organization, like a corporation. Like an AI can't own anything. Even a company is allowed to own assets. So I'm curious, to me, an AI bill of rights would be, how are we gonna think about these things as entities in their own right, sort of the way we think about legal organizations? We look at corporations and personhood like oh that's just the way things are but it's fairly recent modern human invention that happened uh, maybe 100 year, 100 years ago or so plus yeah so it'd be interesting to see eventually if case law evolves itself to say okay yes here's the rights humans have for protection against ai but then here's the rights that ai have in when they're acting in the workplace yeah so um, far they've been discussing copyright and saying an ai can't have a copyright to say an image or a song which is interesting because a lot of the tools that modern artists or mu musicians use are very sophisticated. And you could argue that they don't always have direct, precise control over them. I could use Photoshop or a synthesizer to make a creative work. I could get copyright over it once I'm done, but it's not really clear that 100% of the work involved was really coming from me. That's true, it's extremely murky, I think with this AI and these lawsuits are happening, we have an idea of like how the AI was looking through all these data sets and came up with an answer because it might be looked at something at Wikipedia and something at Twitter and it came up with a response. But when it comes to humans, like I think that all new ideas are usually 80, 85% something that we already heard and seen. And then maybe 10 or 15% are our own unique personal experiences that we then remix into a new idea. And that's why you see some of the best inventors are people who focus in one domain and then went to a second domain that didn't have those previous ideas and just remixed it and voila, you have something new. And transfer uh, between domains. I also thought that it was really interesting watching the interview with Jeffrey Hinton, who just left Google recently. And they asked him something about if you hadn't worked on this, how long would it have taken for these breakthroughs to happen? And I think his answer was like a couple months. He's probably being a little bit humble there, but he's also thinking like all these ideas were being developed in the environment. He added to them. He accelerated them. He added his own creative energy. But without him, someone else would have taken those same steps maybe another six months or a year later. And I think that's also very realistic. People have this idea that the one creative individual made the step, but to your point, it might be more that it's in the environment and someone's going to take that step. 
Exactly. Uh, and that's what ties back to our question about what happens if they slow down the development of AI. I think a lot of people are conscious of the global nature of this research and that if some group decides to slow down or not pursue it, other groups are going to just race ahead. Jeffrey also talked about he's really concerned about fake news and what AI can produce. Love to hear about your thoughts on that. Well, the fake news thing is a little bit complicated and maybe tainted because I think it's been used as a way to surveil people and to restrict what they can do. So I'll leave that part aside. I think what's what he's getting at is that if you have a good language model or even a good diffusion model for images, you can tailor the content to a specific group or individual and really engage with that person in a way that you couldn't before a sort of one-on-one -on -one custom content approach. And if you were trying to mislead someone or shape their opinion, tools like this are just a huge advantage. And you could imagine them being used to sway public opinion or maybe influence an election, which is a huge fear. I was thinking about just all of a sudden, if you can get the consciousness of a politician, put them in a bot, go to their campaign website and ask them very specific questions tailored to you and get a response back. I think that's a real possibility. I was just working with my dad on using ChatGPT to write a letter to a local politician. And we did that because he has arthritis and he's super excited about that. But then we got a response like two weeks later and it was someone in their staff who was handwriting it, hopefully using GPT. But it would be fantastic if you could just message a bot and just hear what the politician's thoughts are in a policy or a paper without actually having to go through the whole entire process. I think what you mentioned also ties to Cambridge Analytica, how they were basically using ads directly to target people who are on the fence towards a certain politician and giving them a nudge. Hopefully that would maybe lean them to their side. That targeting plus ad now on, on top of it, then wow, that would have definitely some interesting implications. I think um, that's what Jeffrey is thinking of. He's thinking, okay, in those cases, it was fairly primitive. You were picking the right ad for that person based on their interests to nudge them in the direction you wanted. But here you could go one much bigger step and engage them in a conversation or with images or with video directly to influence them. That's a much more subtle approach, especially to your point, if they don't know if they're talking to a real person or to a bot. And I think also there is an aspect of when it comes to just our immuno health that it's good that people are exposed to different types of germs and things like that. So their body builds up an immunity. And I think now, like when I'm watching TV and I see a commercial, I'm like, oh, that's a commercial. Eh, don't trust anything. But back in the day, people saw commercials. They're like, oh, this is legit. I should follow what they're saying here. Why would they lie to me? And Mr. Upset me. I think what's going to happen to our society too is we're all going to become much more skeptical on things that we see and maybe that might create our own inoculation towards this ai that's being used to direct our opinions towards certain views yeah that's a good point people become more subtle more discriminating about each kind of media they learn that okay it's, i can't trust this just because it's on tv or just because i saw it at the movies whatever it will take a little while for them to think the same way about a chat program, maybe, or about stable diffusion or some other media techniques. The question is, how long does it take a person to become used to these approaches? And how rapidly are the approaches themselves being developed? If you believe that the introduction of new technology is accelerating, then at some point, the introduction is going faster than your ability to adapt. Joe, thank you very much for this conversation. I really appreciate it. I always appreciate our conversations about these topics. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. You too, Jordan. Hey, thanks for joining us. If you'd like to see more excellent content, check out these two videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks.